Now let's focus on thyrovigilance. Why should be vigilant regarding thyroid function in diabetes? The reason is quite clear. Number one, diabetes and thyroid may coexist with each other. It can be a chance association because both are so common in society. It can be a pathogenetic based association. There may be times when thyroid dysfunction and dysglycemia coexist with each other as part of a polyglandular pathology. And this polyglandular pathology can be autoimmune, it can be neoplastic. So the examples that we mentioned earlier, polyglandular autoimmune syndromes, multiple endocrine neoplasia and other genetic syndromes, all these hold true for thyrovigilance. The symptoms of thyroid disease and diabetes overlap and they overlap to a great extent. So whenever someone comes to you with asthenia, with energy, A-N-E-R-G-I, G-Y, someone comes to you with weight dysregulation, loss of weight, increase in weight, immediately we will suspect not only diabetes but also thyroid disorders. Whenever someone presents to you with the metabolic syndrome phenotype, we've already mentioned the dhol, dysglycemia, high BP, obesity, obstructive sleep apnea, polycystic ovary syndrome, liver, fatty liver and lipids, dyslipidemia. You have to think diabetes and you have to think thyroid. The clinical features of hypothyroidism are even more closely linked to those of diabetic kidney disease. So pallor or anemia, swelling of the feet, edema, all these can occur in kidney disease and in hypothyroidism. And to make things more challenging for us, kidney disease and hypothyroidism can occur along with each other. The chances of having subclinical hypothyroidism are greater in diabetic kidney disease. So again, we have to be thyrovigilant. We have to screen for both. Dermopathy, skin disease also occurs in diabetes. Diabetic dermopathy is well known. And the similar kind of skin disease can occur with hypothyroidism as well. So all these uh, overlapping clinical features, clinical syndromes, tell us that it makes sense to screen most people with type 2 diabetes and everyone with type 1 diabetes for thyroid disorders. However, if someone has presented to you with acute illness, especially someone who has been admitted in hospital, there is something known as sick thyroid syndrome or sick euthyroid syndrome. The thyroid functions may be abnormal, the T3 and T4 may be low, but it is not necessary that you begin treating the patient as hypothyroid. So we should wait for that acute illness to resolve. Once it is resolved, get a thyroid function test done again and then interpret with caution. Also, in routine diabetes care, we use the HbA1c as a reliable marker for glycemia. But the reliability is impaired in patients with hypothyroidism, even with hyperthyroidism. This is because the turnover of RBCs changes in thyroid disease. Because the RBC turnover changes, the RBC lifespan changes and that leads to alterations in HbA1c reporting. If you remember, we already mentioned that metformin can reduce TSH levels. So if you are struggling with the refractory hypothyroidism and the patient has concomitant diabetes, do think of increasing the metformin dose. Older sulfonylureas, but we don't use them anymore. They are said to have a goitrogenic effect, but they are not used in practice now. And if you remember for pyoglitazone, we said that we should avoid it in patients with osteoporosis. Do keep in mind that most hypothyroid people will have osteopenia. The GLP-1 receptor analogs that we use, liraglutide, dulaglutide, semaglutide, all these drugs are contraindicated in patients with MTC, medullary thyroid carcinoma, and also in patients with a family history of medullary thyroid carcinoma. So do at least ask your patients about past history of thyroid disease, about family history of thyroid disease, 
when you are prescribing a GLP-1 RA. Of course, medullary thyroid carcinoma is extremely rare, but still we must be endocrine vigilant and take a good history. At times, when you manage hyperthyroidism, Graves disease, with impending thyrotoxic crisis, at times we use glucocorticoids. And these corticoids can increase glucose levels, so we should be aware of that as well. At times they may unmask pre-existing diabetes, so we should be aware of that as well. Beta blockers are quite frequently used to manage tachycardia in thyrotoxicosis and these beta blockers may be associated with reduced hypoglycemic awareness. Why so? Because they block the beta receptors, they block adrenergic effect and we all know that adrenaline and noradrenaline are again important counter regulatory hormones which help in detecting hypoglycemia before it becomes too severe. So if you are using high doses of beta blockers, the patient's symptoms of hypoglycemia may get impacted, they may change and we should be aware, we should tell our patients also to be aware of this. As we go on in the natural history of thyroid disease, we find that thyroid disease or thyroid dysfunction can be a common cause of refractory diabetes. Graves disease, uncontrolled, will lead to hyperglycemia. Hashimoto's thyroiditis, uncontrolled, that is hypothyroid, will lead to hypoglycemia. A patient with a TSH of 100 will have less insulin requirement. As you treat the patient and as the TSH improves, as thyroid function improves, you will find that glucose levels will rise and insulin requirements will go up. Your patient may argue with you or your patient may get upset. So we have to preempt this by telling our patient that as we improve your thyroid function, you will find that glucose lowering therapy will need to be up titrated. Please do not worry. Patient will look back at you and patient will say, but why are you worsening my diabetes? Why are you increasing my glucose lowering therapy? The answer that we use here in Haryana is, and we are agricultural belt, what we say is look at this plant in front of you. When you want to grow wheat or when you want to grow rice, what is your aim? You want a tall crop, you want a healthy crop, you want a good bumper yield. If you give more water and more fertilizer to the plant, it will grow taller, it will grow stronger, you will get a better yield. Same thing happens with endocrine disease. If we give you good water and fertilizer, if we give you good hormones, appropriate hormones, whether it is insulin, whether it is thyroxine, you will grow better, you will grow healthier, you will need more fertilizer, you will need more water, but that is part and parcel of life. And finally, the outcome, the yield that you get out of your life, the quality of life, what you are able to manage as a spouse, as a parent, as a son, as a professional, all that will improve. So this is how we counsel our patients regarding these changes in endocrine function and changes in drug requirement.